Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, welcome. Um, do let us know in the chat where you're dialing in from. I'm very curious to know. Um, and what you're drinking. If you're drinking a festive drink, let us know in the chat. Welcome, welcome. I can see the numbers climbing up, so I was just going to pause. Um, let us know in the chat what you're drinking, um, whereabouts you are. Wow, already all over. We've got the USA, we've got London. That's brilliant. Okay, let's get started. Um, so as I said, welcome everybody. My name is um, Anjali. Um, I'm an educator at the WSET School London. Um, I love food. I love Christmas. Um, I love wine, uh, not necessarily in that order. Um, I've got my Instagram handle here and the Instagram handle for WCT School London. If you'd like to follow us, we'll keep in touch. Um, any questions, do put them in the Q&A um, uh, function um, and do keep using the chat to discuss the food pairings that I'm about to um, show. Uh, let us know what you'd pair, uh, things like that. It's always good to know and good to find out. Um, so this uh, webinar, we're going to look at um, food and wine pairing and food and wine pairing specifically with regards to festive foods, but festive foods from around the world. So what I want to do first is just have a little think about what makes good food and wine pairings. It's a world that can be taken pretty seriously by a lot of people. And I'm here to tell you, that you don't even need to break the rules. I'm gonna tell you there are no rules, um, really, because the best food and wine pairing is whatever you want to drink with whatever you want to eat. It really can be as simple as that. Um, our palates are all so different in terms of what we like, what our preferences are. We know that when it comes to food. Um, and hopefully it's, most of you know that when it comes to wine as well, what you like might not be what somebody else does. Um, so, take all of this, uh, pardon the pun, with a little pinch of salt. Um, I think one really important thing to bear in mind, especially as we're talking about festive food pairings, is to pair the mood, not the food. Um, so depending on where you are in the world, um, pair your wines when it comes to things like the weather, the company, um, your own personal preferences, the kind of mood you're in, um, your budget, all sorts of things like that are really, really important when it comes to pairing food and wine together. And actually the most fun I have when it comes to food and wine pairing is experimenting with it. Um, and that's what I've done today and what I'm gonna show you. It's all just a bit of experimentation and we, we can see kind of what works, what doesn't work quite so well, why it might work. Um, so I do encourage you over this festive period, while hopefully you've got some bottles open to experiment as much as you can with um, the different kind of foods and wines that you'll be tasting. Um, so what I'm going to be looking at um, are four food and wine pairings based on some regions around the world. So I'm going to look at some tradition, a traditional kind of Christmas dish from Mexico, India, Denmark, and Japan. Um, these are all places either that I've been lucky enough to go to or that I would dearly, dearly love to go to. Um, and they may not be what you would consider traditional um, pairings. They may be what you consider to be traditional pairings, but hopefully either way, they'll give you a sense of the kind of styles and foods and wine that might um, be worth giving a go and might give you some inspiration um, for adding some things to your festive meal. Um, so I've prepared, I've cooked, my, I've cooked myself a dish from each of these um, regions and paired a wine with them. So I'm going to essentially spend the rest of this webinar sharing with you my findings, um, all in the name of research, um, exactly what I was pairing and why. Um, so a little bit of WSET um, level one, if this may look familiar to you, if you've already taken one of our courses with us. Um, and this is a little bit about, I, I won't go into it in too much detail because you'll look at that in a lot more detail if you take um, the level one with us or if you already have. Um, 
but essentially we can break foods down into several key groups that share several key characteristics and those foods will have certain interactions with wines. And some as a really broad general overview will have more positive or more negative interactions. So as a general rule, sweet food will increase the perception of tannins. So those that mouth drying bitter sensation you can feel on your palate in, in red wines. Um, so they'll increase the perception of those. They'll increase the perception of acidity in your wine. Um, and they will decrease the perception of sweetness and fruitiness. Um, and umami foods will do the same thing. Some of you may or may not have heard uh, the word umami before. Um, it's quite a tricky thing to uh, define actually, but um, it's a very savory um, taste. Um, chefs sometimes call it yumminess. Um, and you find a lot of um, well, foods with a lot of umami in, uh, include things like cooked meat, um, mushroom, uh, soy sauce, miso, parmesan, so it's that real savouriness. And so we have here sweet and umami foods will generally give you a more negative inter in, um, interaction with your, with your wine. So you'll generally be increasing the things you may not seek to want to increase. More of that bitterness, more of that acidity and dialing down that sweetness and fruitiness, which usually we're seeking to, to increase um, when we're pairing food and wine together. So by contrast, salty and acidic foods are considered our food friends. Um, they will smooth out tannins. You can see on the slide here, we've got less drying and bitter. Um, so our tannins will be nice and smoothed out for drinking a red wine. The perception of acidity will also decrease as well. Um, it will increase the perception of fruitiness and body in our wine too. Um, and these are generally things we might want to do when we're pairing food and wine together. Um, we'll have a look at all of these things in a bit more detail when I show you the actual kind of food and wine pairings that we're looking at. Then finally, um, we've got a few other kind of food considerations. Highly flavoured food um, is best uh, matched with a highly flavoured wine, a very intensely flavoured wine and vice versa. So quite delicate food will generally go better with a more delicate wine. Um, fatty or oily food will decrease the perception of acidity in your wine. So it can do um, high acid wines can do a really good job of cutting through that fat. Um, and spicy food, hot chili food will um, increase the, the alcohol burn. And um, some people really like that fire, some people a little bit less so. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, okay, we'll have a look now. I'll reveal my first um, food and wine pairing. We'll start with Mexico. So this is what I made. This is a picture of my kitchen table. Um, and I made um, Mexican tamales. Um, I did three different fillings as well. I was going all out. Um, so I did some with shrimp, um, some with chicken and some with um, black beans and, and some cheese in there as well. So the first thing to consider, if you're making a kind of meal like this and pairing some wine with it, is that there's quite a lot going on. Um, we've got seafood, we've got meat, we've got vegetarian, um, all will bring their different flavours. And I've also got three um, salsas that I made with it. So I've got a, a classic pico de gallo, so a tomato salsa, guacamole, so an avocado salsa with loads and loads of lime in it. Um, and esquitas too, which is kind of corn salad, um, also packed with lime. In fact, all of these things, a lot of lime juice. So really this meal um, traditionally had at Christmas time in Mexico, um, I think because you can really get the whole family involved in making these. So you've got to make the masa, you can wrap them all up in um, lovely kind of soaked corn husks, um, make lots of different fillings and you can all have a go at filling them um, and then steaming them. So a really fun thing to do when you've got a lot of people around. Um, and all of these kind of salsas, all of these sauces, um, these sides essentially, uh, have a lot of acidity to them. And so it's something to really think about when kind of pairing wine and food is that actually it might not be the main um, kind of focus of the dish. It might be all of the extra things we have with it that will really affect the wine that you're having. So I've got here some key food characteristics of this dish. So the fact that they're sour, um, we've got a high acidity dish here, essentially. 
Um, spicy as well. So I wasn't shy with the chili, um, both in the fillings and in the in the pico de gallo, especially. Um, and that it's very varied. So we've got three different fillings in my tamales, and we've also got three different kind of sides to have alongside them. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and that's probably true of most um, kind of meals that we're gonna have and sit down to on Christmas day. So it's something to think about when you've got a lot of different things going on, what is the key kind of wine consideration you want to make? Um, and so I've thought about a few things here. Um, the first thing is that I want the wine to have a high level of acidity. And there's a good rule of thumb. If you're eating a meal that has a lot of acidity to it, you want a wine that can match that high level of acidity. So first things first, I'm looking for a wine that has a high level of acidity. And you can see I've gone with a Pinot Noir, 100% Pinot Noir, a red burgundy. Um, and we know that Pinot Noir has a high level of acidity, so I can tick that box. A few other kind of considerations I wanted to make is that there's quite a lot of kind of different spices in, in this dish. So my three different fillings all had different levels of kind of herbs and spices inside, as well as my three sides. So these spices are quite delicate as well. And I didn't want a wine that would overpower all of this kind of delicate, fresh flavors that were going on. Um, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't getting a really kind of high tannin, high alcohol, really, really super intense wine, um, because I think that would have meant that I would have lost the dish. All I'd be focusing on is the wine. And here I'm really trying to balance the two together. So I wanted to make sure that I found a high acidity wine that also had a delicacy to it um, that would hopefully mirror the kind of delicacy of some of the flavours that I put into the dish. Um, and my last kind of wine consideration is I wanted something versatile. I wanted something that would be very happy had alongside a mouthful of pico de gallo and a mouthful of shrimp tamale, a mouthful of guacamole. Um, so all of these things, I wanted to make sure that the wine would sing alongside each of these individual bites. Um, and so, as I said, I picked a red burgundy. So this is 100% Pinot Noir. And we know that Pinot Noir generally has a lower level of tannin. Um, and this means it won't be super kind of powerful on the palate and potentially overwhelm all the flavors that I've um, put into this dish. Uh, so that's one important thing. The year of this wine is 2012 as well. So this Pinot Noir has some age on it. And that means our tannins will have um, gone a little bit softer as well over time. So we're dealing with a much more kind of delicate style um, of red wine. Um, and I can tell you, this was all an experiment um, that I think the pairing was really, really lovely. Um, the fact that we've still got a red wine and we've got these tannins um, really meant that any of the kind of saltiness as well in the dish was nicely smoothed out. Um, and both of them were able to kind of sing with the dish. Um, they were both kind of of equal levels of delicacy and intensity. So I think this one worked pretty well. Um, Favourably, the, the, the domaine, they um, suggest having with this wine um, beef tartare and also hard cheeses. And I can see why that um, sort so of still beef tartare, still quite an intense dish, but has all this delicacy as well. So um, some other kind of things to think about if you've got um, a lovely bottle of red burgundy at home, uh, worth thinking about pairing. Um, OK, so that is my um, Mexican Christmas food and wine pairing. Um, I'm going to move on to my next one, um, which was uh, a trip to Japan. <laughs> and I've got to say, we put this on our um, school Instagram uh, yesterday, was it today? And um, this one definitely won the votes of uh, which is your favourite looking kind of food and wine pairing. And I can kind of see why. Um, so uh, this was new to me. This is I found this out when I was kind of researching for this webinar that um, KFC, um, a traditional um, uh, food to have at Christmas time in Japan. And um, it hails back from the kind of 70s when the first KFCs were opening. The first general manager of the first KFC in Japan um, decided to kind of um, hang a lot of promotion off Christmas and it's sort of grown from there. So now 3.6 million families will sit down in Japan and have some KFC um, around Christmas time. 
And it's the kind of thing that you have to order weeks and weeks in advance now. It's that popular. Um, so a really kind of fun, uh, festive thing. I mean, who doesn't love fried chicken, fries, um, delicious. And so again, I promise you all in the name of research, um, I ordered myself some KFC um, and I paired it with a sparkling wine, which I'll talk about a little bit um, shortly. So KFC, but this is what I ordered. So I, I, I got um, some of their kind of original recipe chicken, spicy wings. So this has some heat to it, um, some fries, some corn on the cob um, and some of their signature gravy. Um, and so the kind of key food characteristics I'm thinking about here are the fat that it's quite fatty. So a lot of this is fried, um, the chicken, the fries, fried. Um, salty as well. Um, so we've got salt all over the place, especially in the gravy actually, but it was all pretty salty. And this spice coming from those spicy wings. So that's going to give me a little bit of fire. And that's something I want to think about when um, pairing my wine. Um, and my key um, wine consideration um, for this pairing, as you can see, so again, a high level of acidity. And here's the way in which I wanted that high acidity to function was to kind of act a bit like a palate cleanser. Um, there's a lot of richness here, um, a lot of fat, delicious fat, I might add, but um, there's a lot of it. And you want some, a kind of, I would really wanted a kind of fresh, light, high acidity style of wine that could really cut through all of that richness and kind of refresh my palate um, with each mouthful. Um, the kind of style of this meal as well is um, less varied than, for example, the kind of Mexican dish um, that I've just shown you. Um, a lot of it has quite similar characteristics, this fattiness, this saltiness. And so I thought in that sense, the wine can afford to, to sing a little bit more and to be a little bit more complex here. So I wanted to find a wine that had a lot of different layers to it, be that a lot of different kind of fruity flavours, in this case, I wanted some more kind of savoury notes in there to perhaps kind of um, sing alongside all that savouriness from the meal. Um, and my final kind of consideration is that I wanted the wine to be a little bit lower in alcohol. And that's in case I got all that fire, all that chilli heat from those spicy wings. Um, I wanted a wine that wouldn't increase all of that spice. Um, so the kind of three key considerations have left me with um, uh, an English sparkling wine. I thought it'd be nice to, to rep a wine um, from uh, where I'm uh, calling in from. And I've gone with this wine from Langham Estate. Um, so they're based in Dorset in the, in the south of England. And this is their Blanc de Blanc. Um, so you may know, you may not, that Blanc de Blanc that um, translates to white of whites. And it means we're making a sparkling wine. In this case, this wine is made in exactly the same way as champagne. And we're using 100% Chardonnay, our white grape variety, um, for uh, these kind of classic traditional method sparkling wines. Um, and this wine does have a lot of layers to it. So it's got lots of kind of fruity flavours from our Chardonnay, lots of kind of apple notes as well, um, lots of citrus, Again, working as a really nice kind of palate refresher um, between, between mouthfuls of fries, um, as well as this um, kind of bready note to it, this real kind of rich brioche character. So although the wine is still very fresh and high acidity, it's still got something that will kind of complement that KFC, that kind of rich buttery bready um, kind of note to it. Um, the Chardonnay they've used in this wine is 100% um, barrel, uh, barrel fermented. So it's still got all of that um, aromas from use of oak barrels. So some vanilla, some toast and clove, things like that. Um, and so I gotta say, it's really worth trying this pairing. It was really quite something. Um, traditional method sparkling wine. If you can't find um, this uh, Langham wine, then other kind of traditional method sparkling wines would work a treat alongside anything that you're eating around the kind of festive period that has quite a lot of kind of fried food, quite a lot of fat, um, but you still want something really delicious to drink, something really kind of complex and still really fresh. Um, it really is a really, really lovely wine. So I really recommend, yeah, giving that a go, or something like it a go. That was a top pairing. 
Um, okay, I'll move along now to um, my next uh, food and wine pairing. And here I have made um, a classic kind of festive spread um, from Denmark. And um, I've done a little bit of research with some, some of the people I work with upstairs, actually. We've got a Dane, we've got a Dane in um, who helped kind of show me the kind of things that he would normally eat um, around Christmas time. I've been, I'm under strict instruction uh, to say that the crackling is incredibly important. And I got to say, I worked very hard on this crackling because I didn't want to mess it up. Um, and also that in Denmark, you traditionally eat a meal like this on the 24th of December, so um, Christmas Eve in the evening. So it'd be your big kind of evening meal um, before the next day, the kind of Christmas day proper, as it were. Um, and we've got um, roast pork with aforementioned crackling, uh, which did crackle quite um, satisfyingly, I'm pleased to report. Um, Fleskist egg is how I've been told to pronounce it. I've been practicing that quite a lot. Um, and then we've also got um, caramelized potatoes, um, Bruneda kartoffler. That's, that's probably terrible Danish, I apologize. Um, and if you haven't tried something like this, I encourage you to give it a go because they're essentially potatoes that are boiled up and then cooked in um, butter and sugar. My God, they are delicious. If you didn't think potatoes could get better, they can. Put some sugar on them. Um, and then we've got some red cabbage as well, um, rotkal. Um, again, apologies. Um, and this brings a, an awful lot of sweetness as well. So in terms of my food um, characteristics, we've definitely got a lot of salt here, um, all over that crackling um, seasoned in the potatoes and the cabbage as well. Um, we've got savouriness too, so that umami character coming through, particularly from the pork. Um, I think what's interesting about this meal is that it's got a lot of sweetness to it, even though it's a kind of savoury main meal, it's not a dessert. Um, and that's all those potatoes um, with that kind of sweet kind of caramelised character on them. And that red cabbage also quite sweet. So one of the key considerations was to have something that could act well alongside that sweetness in this meal. It's also very rich. Um, so we've got um, really rich pork with all that crackling. We've got sweet potatoes. Um, and so I wanted to make sure again, um, it's sort of a trend running through this that I also had a wine with a high level of acidity, again, to kind of cut through all of that richness. Um, so I've chosen here a, a Vouvray. So we're in the Loire here and we've got 100% Chenin Blanc. And the wine in particular that I've chosen is a dummy sec. Um, so this is an off dry wine, um, which means it does have a little bit of sweetness. It's not all the way over into, into a dessert wine, um, but it's got just enough sweetness that um, you can kind of pick it up, adds a bit of interest into the wine, good kind of vessel for a little bit more flavor in there as well. Um, and that was really with those kind of sweeter potatoes in mind to kind of balance that out. And it worked pretty well. I think if I'd have paired with, with a kind of meaty dish like this, one might think a red wine is the thing to go with. Um, I suppose that's more classic. Um, and it may be worth experimenting with that. Um, in fact, I'll definitely try experimenting with it next time I make this dish. But I sort of thought that with something with this kind of level of sweetness, one of the things to really um, focus on was if I had a wine with some high levels of tannin, potentially they'd feel even more bitter with all that kind of sweetness from those potatoes. So I went um, with a white and as I said, this kind of off dry style to kind of balance out and again, sing alongside those caramelized potatoes. Um, this wine also has a lot of really strong kind of Appley aromas, um, baked apple, um, uh, bruised apple, dried apple, all the apples are in this wine. And as we know, pork and apple are really classic combination. And there was no kind of appley um, component of this dish, but I think the wine brings this nice kind of um, pork and apple kind of character to it. 
In fact, I do have a little glass here, which I'm not drinking, but I certainly will um, uh, have a little sip if I can remember as I go through. Um, really, really delicious wine. And it's got a, also a lot of complexity um, running through it. So yes, all of this apple character, um, but this kind of dry, true, kind of nutty um, aromas to it as well. Um, and still really, really refreshing really despite that kind of sweetness still a really lovely high level of acidity in there um, to balance out and cut through all that richness um, of the pork and the potatoes um, so again another i've got to say another successful pairing was really really delicious um, okay i'll move along now to my kind of dessert portion, let's say, um, and that is using um, a dish from India. So um, I'm half Indian and um, this is one of my favorite Indian desserts and one which we would have a lot uh, around Christmas time, uh, partly because I sort of feel far too guilty having it at another time of year because it is fried dough soaked in syrup, which yes, is definitely delicious. If you haven't tried gulab jamun before, then please do give it a go. Um, it was very fun to make as well. I'd never made it before, um, but it's fun to kind of assemble the dough. It's not too difficult. Um, fry it up and then dunk it in this kind of syrup that I've then I've flavoured with um, cardamom and saffron. Um, and this is a very, very, very sweet dish. So you can see from, from the image that my gulab jamuns here, they are, they are kind of floating in a very, very sweet syrup. So it's not for the faint hearted. Um, and so that was a key consideration, a really important one. Um, and another kind of key characteristic of this dish is that it's very aromatic. So there's a lot of kind of delicate spicing both through the kind of dough, um, and in the syrup as well. So I've got cardamom in there, I've got saffron. I put in a little tiny bit of rose water as well. So it's this really kind of beautiful perfumed um, dish too. And that was something that I really wanted to make sure didn't get lost, didn't get overpowered um, or anything like that when I was pairing. Um, so my key wine considerations are that um, I wanted the wine to be sweet. This was very important. It needs to be sweet to match up to all of that sweetness in the dessert. Um, I also want it to have a high level of intensity. So I didn't want it to be super duper delicate because this um, dish packs a punch. It's really quite intense itself. It's all that syrup, all of those kind of um, aromats in there, that cardamom, saffron, rose water. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that the wine could stand up to a dish like that. And again, your friend and mine, acidity. I wanted to make sure that the wine also had a high level of acidity. Again, I needed it to be sweet, of course, but I also wanted it to be able to cut through all of that kind of syrupy sweetness and not have the, the final kind of pairing be way, way, way too rich or way, way, way too sweet. Potentially for some, this is already quite sweet, but I wanted to make sure that the wine had a high level of acidity to kind of be able to stand up there, refresh the palate, give um, the kind of whole pairing some structure as well. Um, and so I've gone with a Sauterne. Um, so this is a kind of classic sweet wine from Bordeaux. Um, and we've got a blend of different grapes here. So we've got 85% Semillon, 13% Sauvignon Blanc and 2% uh, Muscadel. And um, those last two grape varieties, our Sauvignon Blanc and our Muscadel, those are what we call aromatic grape varieties. So they bring um, to the wine a kind of delicate, perfumed, floral, um, slightly herbaceous uh, character to the wine. Um, and I wanted to make sure that this wine, the wine that I paired, did have some kind of um, aromatic intensity, of slightly something slightly floral or herbaceous, something like that. But I didn't want it to be intensely aromatic, smelling intensely, intensely perfumed, um, because I wanted the the, um, the aromatics that I used in the gulab jamun to kind of um, do that for the pairing rather than the wine. And so, yes, this wine does have some kind of aromatic um, aromas to it. We've got some kind of floral notes, some blossom, honeysuckle, um, some elderflower, a little bit of a grassy character as well. Um, 
but it's also got um, some uh, aromas from oak barrels. So we've got some kind of vanilla going on here, some um, smoke, some kind of toasty characters too. Uh, so that provides a nice kind of um, contrast with all of those more perfume characters in, in the dessert. Um, uh, again, a, a really lovely pairing. Um, potentially for some a little bit too sweet, but um, I love the sweet stuff. So it worked really beautifully for me. Um, I gotta say, I didn't have all of this on the same day, though uh, that would have been quite something. These were all, uh, these were all on different days, little, little treats along the week, um, but it would be something to try, definitely. Um, okay, so those are my four key um, foods and, and paired wines. And hopefully, even if you're not going to kind of emulate these, these exact dishes, hopefully you've got a sense of what the kind of key characteristics you want to kind of look at in your dish, and then maybe try to either kind of contrast with the wine or have something to um, complement it, um, something like that. So I've just got to kind of finish up a few kind of little takeaways. Um, so firstly, as you may have noticed, um, acid is uh, a really important thing uh, when pairing wine and food. And, and I've found that in fact, every wine pairing that I did on this project, or it wasn't deliberate, but they all had high levels of acidity. I think that was actually very important for all of the dishes. Uh, as you see, I've put here that festive food is often very rich and regardless of which specific cuisine you're having. Um, so that richness, is often really pleasantly offset by a wine that has a high level of acidity. Um, so definitely when you're looking to pair, um, try and find wines that you know have high levels of acidity or grape varieties that you know do um, as well. Um, my second kind of consideration is, is not to forget the sides. So we had a little look at that when we looked at our Mexican um, food and wine pairing uh, with all of those kind of extra, um, my pico de gallo, my guacamole, my um, esquitas, those all actually um, were the things to really focus on in terms of um, pairing my wine and food um, together. And things like sauces, sides, if you've got something like a lot of cranberry sauce, that's actually going to be quite a sweet plate of food, for example. Um, uh, if you've got a creamy sauce versus a quite a, um, a sour kind of vinegary sauce, um, these kind of things will be the important things potentially rather than the kind of key ingredient that you've used. So don't forget um, to consider those. Um, my third uh, kind of little takeaway is that especially at this time of year, we're often eating a lot of different um, foods from a lot of different places, different people. Um, you're often with a bunch of your kind of family and friends who all have different kind of foodie habits and foodie preferences. So we're often eating a lot of different things. Um, so if you can pick a wine that's versatile, um, that's often the safest bet. And by that, I mean, a wine that you know you'll enjoy with or without the food that's in front of it, because you can't really go wrong um, if you go down that route. So make sure you've got a wine that doesn't require specific foods in order for you to really enjoy it. Um, and my fourth and final, um, have fun with it. It's I hope um, that you've kind of got a little bit of inspo from this, but also that you just experiment with whatever weird and wonderful food and wine pairings you can think of. Um, it's a really good um, time to experiment with these kind of things and a really fun thing to do. And I think people can get a little bit worried about it, but there's nothing to be worried about. It's just such a fun um, thing to try and to test out. Um, so yeah, see what you think and let us know. Um, and that is, pretty much everything from me. I can see we've got a few questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna pick some of those up. Um, so let me just have a little look. Do you have the recipes for the Danish dishes? I actually got them from um, my colleague who I work with upstairs, Mark. Um, and so I can dig it out for you. I did quite a lot of research into perfect crackling as well. Um, but if you get in touch with me on Instagram, I can send you all my findings. Um, ice wine with the gulab jamun, an excellent point. That was, in fact, that was one of the kind of key, uh, my key options that I was going to go with. And that's partly because ice wine has even more sweetness than something like a sautern. And so with a really, really sweet dish like gulab jamun, um, I think ice wine would be a brilliant pairing, a really brilliant pairing. Just wanna make sure that um, you chill it down nicely. 
um, because it can be, it's so, so sweet. Um, the same with the Sauterne actually, but yeah, that is a fantastic pairing. Um, okay, oh, I've got a question about vintages. So how do you decide which vintage is best when picking um, a wine for a food pairing? Vintage is a really tricky thing. Um, I think if you want a wine that ends up having a few more kind of savoury aromas to it, so things like nuts um, or a kind of meaty, uh, leathery kind of character in your red, something like that, you want a wine that regardless of the specific vintage does have some age on it. And by some age, again, it's a bit like how long is a piece of string, but um, four or five years old, um, you'll start to see some of those um, aromas uh, pretty reliably developing in a wine. Um, when it comes to vintages with, with um, kind of classic wines, particularly from France, so things like Champagne, actually, um, uh, uh, parts of Tuscany, um, Bordeaux and Burgundy, you can quite readily find um, vintage guides um, online. So I often refer to those if I'm, especially if I want to kind of splash out on a special wine, um, look for, uh, a specific kind of vintage guide for the wines that you're looking at, um, just to make sure that you're getting a wine that's of kind of a high quality year, potentially. Um, so there's a few different ways to go about it. But yeah, if you get a wine with a few years on it, um, four or so, then you're likely to get these kind of more savoury characters. And that's what I was going for, for example, with the, um, the Mexican Pinot Noir pairing. Um, Okay, let me have a look. What would you pair with traditional Indian curries and gravies? It's a good question. Um, I actually think um, Indian food has a, a lot of um, a lot of options when it comes to um, food pairing, a uh, wine pairing. Uh, so, hmm, the classic is your is your really aromatic um, wines, potentially slightly lower in alcohol as well, and that's partly to offset that chili. Um, heat. So um, a, a, a Spätleser Riesling from Germany is, is really lovely. A Gewürztraminer, as long as the alcohol is not super high, can be really, really lovely as well. Um, something to help kind of mirror those um, delicate spices in those foods uh, can be really lovely. Um, so for me personally, I'd go for definitely a wine with a slightly lower level of alcohol. Um, if you've got um, food dishes that have lots of chili. Um, also, if, if all else fails, like don't forget about sparkling wine. They can be really, really food friendly wines. So um, things like champagne, Prosecco, Carver, really, really lovely with um, a lot of kind of delicately spiced food, like a lot of Indian food is. Uh, so definitely give those a go. Um, in general, do you believe contrasting or complementary wine pairing is the way to go? So um, that's a really good question. There are two kind of schools of thought, really. So you either marry same, same. So for example, a, an oaky Chardonnay with mac and cheese. So that kind of really creamy Chardonnay with a kind of creamy mac and cheese very delicious, or you'd pair it with something um, really fresh and light, that mac and cheese to cut through it and kind of contrast um, those aromas and flavors. Uh, uh, to be honest, I think both are really good ways to go, and I don't have I don't have a preference. They'd both be um, really brilliant. Uh, it's again one of those kind of experimenting things, but they're definitely two good things to kind of keep in mind. Either am I going to keep it um, to to enhance those flavours and mirror them a little bit, or am I going to act as a real contrast and kind of um, refresh the palate a bit more between between bites? Um, if you were forced to go with a white for the Mexican dinner, what would you have considered? Um, Riesling, uh, I think. Uh, so potentially not uh, a sweet one, maybe a, a dry one, maybe from Alsace, uh, maybe even an, an Aussie Riesling. I think that would be really lovely. Um, yeah, definitely give that a go. All that acidity as well, kind of cutting through and Riesling giving some, some delicate, it's still delicate. So we kind of complement all those um, delicate aromas and flavors in the, in the food. Um, uh, Mediterranean cuisine pairing guide. That's another good question. Something that I haven't really mentioned is um, what if if all else fails? Well, number one, consider sparkling wine, and number two, um, I think a good rule of thumb that we haven't really touched on is is what grows together goes together. So when you're thinking about the Mediterranean, say you're in like thinking about a um, a, a ratatouille from from Provence, for example, maybe a, a lovely Provence rosé to go alongside that, or um, 
a spicy red from down there, something like that. Um, it's really difficult to make a mistake if what the wine, where the wine is being made, where the vines are, and the traditional food of that region, um, it's very difficult to go wrong if you go that way. Um, would you pair puy fume with raclette or melted cheese dishes? Uh, absolutely, I would. That sounds lovely. Um, I think you've got to be careful that the cheese isn't super, super strong. Um, uh, goat's cheese is very classic with that wine. So if you get, I mean, that wouldn't be traditional for a raclette, but if you can get some goat's cheese in there, that would also be lovely. Um, uh, oh, yes, I've heard about this Danish Danish rice pudding um, dish. Um, so I've got uh, somebody asking about recommendations for um, risamand. Risalamand? There we go. Uh, Danish rice pudding. I've heard all about this. Um, so it's a rice pudding that, um, so Mark upstairs told me that uh, you can hide a whole almond in it and it's sort of a game to try to find, find the whole almond. Um, in terms of a wine pairing, oh, very interesting. Um, I think, uh, maybe um, a Madeira, a sweeter Madeira or a sweeter sherry might be nice. That kind of burnt sugar caramelly um, aroma really complementing that kind of creamy, milky rice pudding um, flavour. Um, oh, that's a very tricky question from Julia. Which wine would you recommend as an all rounder if you have to pick only one for the whole meal? Um, this is this is where personal preference really comes in. I think I would go um, personally for a traditional method sparkling wine, um, especially if we're being fancy, some a, a kind of festive time. Uh, so something like champagne or, or, or English sparkling wine or um, method cap classique from South Africa. Um, or the kind of fantastic traditional method wines that you find um, all around the world. I'd probably pair those because I find them incredibly versatile. They've always got lovely levels of acidity and I just find them really delicious. Um, uh, any wines, a good match with vegetarian dishes, lots of vegetables and diced tomato. Um, ha have a go with um, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, might be really lovely with that because we've got all that kind of herbaceous character um, running through it. Um, something like if it's a kind of richer dish on the same kind of style, but for, for a red, maybe a, um, a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Carmenere, again, with that slight kind of herbaceous character running through to kind of complement um, any of that green greenery going through your veggie dish. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to go. Um, okay, what would you pair with marzipan? Um, Oh my gosh, that's a very good question. Marzipan. So maybe actually a um, a sweet Chenin Blanc from, from the Loire Valley. Um, uh, so a Bonizer or something like that um, would be really, really lovely. So turn equally. I'd want um, potentially to, to have a wine that has... Um, uh, has had some age on it, a sweet wine that's had some age on it, because as, as a sweet um, white wine ages, it'll develop this kind of nutty character, which I think would be that kind of um, complementary food pairing um, idea. So potentially an aged Sauterne or an aged um, Chenin Blanc from the Loire um, would be really lovely. Um, why did you choose all the wines from the old world? Any region, reasons for this? Um, no, actually, uh, coincidence. I wanted to make sure that we had um, some diversity of style and I just wanted to make sure that they were they were really, really kind of classic um, examples. And that often led me to, um, to some of these regions, but no real reason that there are some fantastic, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, wines from all around the world, particularly outside of Europe that have been sadly left off. But if I do another one, I'll definitely um, feature in a few of them. Um, how do you decide between red and white wine for your pairings as a starting point? Um, to be honest, the, the way I did that was I, I, I didn't decide actively. I, I first thought about the kind of components I want in the wine and the fact that it's red or white um, was inconsequential, really. Um, the thing to be aware of when it comes to your reds is, is those tannins um, and those can um, pack a punch and be quite powerful. So if you've got something delicate, uh, potentially easier avoided or a wine with lower tannins. Um, and uh, salt, if you've got something really, really salty, you might want a red 
that has high levels of tannins that you could kind of smooth out, but no, no real reason. Um, oh my gosh, Sebastian, marzipan and champagne. You've absolutely nailed it there. I think that is a fantastic pairing. Um, a sweet champagne and a, um, and a marzipan dish would be absolutely de delicious. Um, which wine would you pair with a more traditional English Christmas meal? So here I think we're talking about turkey, um, uh, stuffing, roast potatoes. Again, a lot of richness here. Um, I'm going to be boring and say my answer again is probably a traditional method sparkling wine. Um, if not, other kind of Chardonnays, uh, I think would be really, really lovely. Um, you could also go Pinot Noir if you definitely want a red. I know um, Beaujolais is quite traditional for, for Thanksgiving meals um, in the state, so uh, I can see why. It's got that lovely kind of freshness and all that red fruit. Um, so that's one to, to suggest. Um, what do you eat and drink in the UK for Christmas? My boss is British. Um, yes, a bottle of sherry. So um, a bottle of sherry would be fantastic. Sherry port as well, very, very classic um, at Christmas time over here. It's when they all come out. Um, so you can't go wrong with either of those. Um, a traditional American dinner. Um, I'll have to research that for the next one um, and also put in some American wines. I think they've been sadly missed off. Uh, so I'll have a think about that for the next one. But I imagine similar kind of thing to an English Christmas dinner. So um, turkey, um, roast potatoes, things like that. Um, uh, what products would you ideally avoid um, to pair a wine with? Um, what, one of the hardest food and wine pairings I find is, is chocolate. Um, I, I, that's one of the only things that I think, you know what, I'm not sure I want a wine with this. I find chocolate really, really difficult food and wine pairing. Um, traditionally, people say asparagus is quite difficult and artichoke, but I've never had too much of a problem with those. It's chocolate. I'm always like, oh, it's one or the other. It's one of the others. Um, okay. Uh, difficult to pair, so turn. Um, so turn, I think, uh, so this is a sweet wine, um, and I think it's actually a pretty food friendly wine. It goes, it's classic with, um, lemon tart, uh, foie gras as well. If we're having any of that over Christmas. Um, so those things can be, uh, really lovely to pair alongside equally when it comes to a wine like that. Um, especially if it's a high quality wine that you've really been looking forward to. Oh yes, sorry, Jane said, so turn and rock for, that is definitely um, a, good, a good option. Um, uh, sometimes it's, it's quite nice to just let that wine sing. So you might not necessarily want to pair a food with it. It might just be that you just really want to appreciate that wine and watch it evolve um, over the kind of evening. Uh, so that could be really lovely. Um, the best food wine pairing um, you've ever had uh i gotta say that kfc and that langham sparkling wine does come quite close um equally the wines that i've had on holidays um are also really really lovely so um specifically dry sherry and lots of kind of different tapas dishes from the south of spain oh lovely um what would you pair what red wine would you pair with turkish meze um, lots of garlic spices, yogurt, etc. Um, my instinct here, here is, is also um, Pinot Noir. Um, so you've got still that lovely acidity, but also still that delicacy, uh, potentially um, a wine that I haven't really talked about. And again, hopefully we'll kind of talk about the next one is um, uh, rosé. So rosé is really, really food friendly. And I think with um, Turkish mezi, if you get a lovely, um, light, fresh rosé um, with all that kind of varied spicing, kind of different kind of levels of um, spice and flavour and, and kind of richness, um, a light kind of um, rosé uh, could be really, really lovely and just bring everything together. Um, Claret, Cynthia's asked about what to pair with Claret. So Claret is, is Bordeaux. Um, I assume you mean a red Bordeaux. Um, and I think what's classic is steak. So um, red meat uh, is definitely worth trying. Um, or if you've got a slightly more kind of um, uh, approachable style of, of Bordeaux, maybe something like a burger, a cheeseburger, oh, delicious. Um, so turn and churros. Yes, I approve Olga. That would be delicious. Uh, let me know how you do with that. That sounds amazing. Um, 
what type of cheese um, and style of dish would you pair with a pit bull? Um, uh, cheese and wine, I think, uh, it's, it's a whole other topic in itself, really. But um, Pickpool is a very delicate, fresh, citrusy, light style of wine. And so I don't think you want a really, really intense, heavy cheese. I think you want to think of your kind of lighter cheeses. So maybe um, uh, a young goat's cheese would be really, really lovely with that. Um, what else? Uh, maybe a kind of uh, uh, a young kind of brie, something like that would also be really lovely. I'm not sure what would be classic down there. Um, so turn and Tur we've got our yes. So turn and churros. I've I've um, uh, I've touched on. I definitely approve. Uh, so I think that's all of our all of our questions. Uh, oh, I've got one more. Um, cheese and wine is its own topic. Yeah, absolutely. Ch cheese and wine is it's one of those things that there's so there's as many different cheese and wine pairings as there are cheeses and wines. And so um, it would be a worthwhile experiment seeing how uh, to kind of navigate that and find find a good all rounder. Um, so yes, more on that, hopefully in the new year, I'll do some experimenting for you. Um, I really don't mind. Uh, okay. I think that's all our questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, and uh, I, I hope you I hope you got some good tips. I hope um, I answered some of your questions. Again, my, my handle um, was on the kind of front side. I'm Angelie Douglas Wine, or do follow WSET School London um, as well on Instagram. And do, uh, yeah, send me a message, get in touch, let me know what uh, any food or wine pairings that you particularly have been enjoying over this festive um, period. Uh, thank you so much, guys.